Hi everyone and welcome to Scottish Summit 2021. I'm sure you've all got a jam-packed day full of amazing sessions ahead of you and uh, we have so many <laughs> incredible speakers um, at this event this year so thank you for letting this session be, be a part of your Scottish Summit day. Before we um, get going just want to give a big shout out to um, the six companies that are sponsoring uh, this event. Without them, we wouldn't be able to offer this event for, for free uh, for you all to, to join in with. So huge thanks to Scriptrunner, uh, DQ Global, Proximo3, Redspire, Agilisys and Hitachi Solutions. Absolutely amazing um, that they've put in the, the extra effort and extra mile to make sure that we can still have um, Scottish Summit even with uh, the global lockdown situation with COVID-19. So huge thanks across the board. So a um, little bit of a brief background on uh, myself. Who, who am I? Um, so my name is Clarissa Gillingham and uh, I've been working with uh, Power Apps and Power Platform for um, just under two years now. I started uh, May 2019, so coming up to my second Power Up anniversary, as it were. Um, before then, I literally had absolutely no knowledge of the Microsoft stack. Um, basically, I thought that Office 365 was Word, Excel and PowerPoint, and I had no knowledge beyond, beyond that at all. Uh, so I've really come from the ground up, as it, as it were. But during um, those almost two years now, um, I've worked with two different uh, Microsoft partners and managed to create um, over two dozen uh, Power Apps solutions for uh, customers across the country. Um, on top of that, some additional Power Automate and Power BI ones, but my, my specialty is in uh, Canvas Apps. So as as you can probably tell, um, that's that's why the topic for today um, is about UI in Canvas apps specifically. Um, currently, I'm working as a Power Platform Configuration Consultant at ANS Group, and it's been uh, I've been there since the end of September. Obviously, feel free to follow me on on socials. Um, I'm active on on Twitter, so if you like what you see, um, or if you just want to hang out and chat about different Power Platform stuff, um, hit me up on there. Um, I'll always be be ready to have a conversation and maybe help you out with it with anything that you're stuck on. Um, so today's session, of course, is all about uh, how to create some engaging UI in Canvas apps. And we're really going to be looking at um, not just applications, but really how we take the, the science behind um, composition of images, framing of images, how how the human mind perceives images to enable us to actually take steps to make our applications more visually appealing. So without further ado, um, if we get started in here, why would we care um, about UI? That, that, is, that is the first question. Um, and the answer really is that UI is is that core selling point of Canvas apps. There is a lot of a lot of stuff that you can do with model driven apps. If anyone has um, come through from the dynamic side of things, you'll know that there is actually a lot that you can offer in terms of dynamics and model driven apps. So why would you ever uh, want to make a canvas app, and this this is the question that when I joined at ANS, who were more of a Dynamics um, partner, a lot of my colleagues were asking, well, why why would we make canvas apps? When would we um, when would we suggest canvas apps to our customers? And the core reason uh, behind why I would pick canvas apps um, for a solution over uh, model driven apps is when that, when that particular requirement or use case requires a user who is not trained in, you know, the specific kind of medium like dynamics, when we want that user to be able to intuitively just pick something up and interact with the data. Because with Canvas apps, we can create that custom bespoke user interface, user experience that will really allow the user to drive that uh, experience forward, to actually um, engage with the data 
in a much more meaningful and bespoke manner. So really the core selling point behind Canvas apps and it's in its little corner of the power platform is the fact that it is that user interface. It's that nice shiny veneer that allows people to have access to power platform data and data stored in Dataverse without actually needing to realize that that's what they're doing. It just looks to them like they're using a native app like they normally would on their phone or device. So when we talk about user interface, what do we what do we mean? How how are we going to actually utilize a a user interface to create this um, engagement and this this ability to intuitively work with something? So UI, um, it really the the goal of it is to enable this effective operation of applications. What you want your kind of end goal, your dream is to be able to put your application in front of your users and without needing to tell them how to use it or um, show them any guides or teach them anything, they should be able to just get going, plug and play straight away, um, get through, navigate, start using the application. And that might sound like a bit daunting or a bit of a pipe dream, but I mean, this is the experience that we all have when we're now you know, just downloading an app from the App Store or from Google Play, it doesn't come with a training manual. And it's that effective operation um, that when we're going through apps, we know intuitively how to operate them. And we know that operating them will be able to uh, get us there there quickly. We know how to use it in an effective manner. So we need to design user interfaces that allow the user to use those skills and be able to present the information to them in a way that is easy for them to then digest uh, and view. They can really quickly get to places. And if you're doing it really, really well, then you can actually guide users' decision-making through the user interface that you create. Um, so there are a lot of a lot of different tools like use of colors, use of uh, different spacing, the way that you um, create a kind of flow through the screen that will allow users um, to instantly pick up on, ah, oh, there's, there's a notification that's come in, there's a warning, I need to quickly go and um, take action on that. Just a, a simple thing like a, a red warning triangle that pops up and flashes, that immediately is UI that is aiding the user's decision making process. So this is really the, the questions that we need to consider when we're designing applications and designing UIs is how are we surfacing that information to the user? And when we're thinking about that, we need to think about how could we improve the way that that is being surfaced? What is the um, experience that the user is having? How is the user interacting with the application? Um, is it in an active manner, a passive manner? Um, is there anything that we can do to improve that experience? And obviously, of course, what impression is our design giving the user? Your UI will be the first thing that your users notice. Um, and it will have the biggest impression on them. And this kind of leads us into uh, this next statement, which is that a good app with a bad UI is a bad app. You can have all the most amazing functionality in the world, but if your app is clunky, difficult to use, and people don't get on with it, then they're never gonna, gonna actually find that really great functionality that you've got hidden away in there. So there is no way to create a good app without creating good UI. You really need to focus on how we can give that first impression to, to say, yes, this, this is an application that you would want to use. And this again brings us on to um, how the, the power of a good UI can lead to mass adoption of uh, applications um, going through through businesses. We, we all know that one of the, the key things that we always try and do is boost adoption um, of, of these business applications. But really, um, 
if it's a really good application, then it should kind of sell itself. You shouldn't need to um, make a pitch for it or make a case for it. If you've got that first impression that people see it and they go, oh, wow, that looks interesting, that looks good. If they're able to use it intuitively and they don't need any training or there's no blockers for them to get, get actually into it, then they're going to be um, more likely to keep using it. You have that retention. And if people are able to um, use it effectively and if the application's design and its uh, user experience guides them through the process that they are supposed to be performing in an efficient manner, then they're going to see those gains. And we always need to remember that it's, it's those gains that we're really need to focus on um, when we're designing. We, we don't make apps um, just because it's really fun, um, although making apps is really, really fun <laughs> um, with Power Apps. We, we make applications so that our users can perform their tasks, but in a quicker, more efficient, less stressful way. The UI should always be enabling this process. If you're ever in a situation uh, where you've gone to an application and you've felt that frustration <laughs> of just not being able to find the information you need or not being able to understand how to navigate to where you want to go, that isn't increasing someone's productivity. That's trying to solve their pain point, but actually giving them another pain point. Um, what we need to be able to do is to make sure that our apps are as pain-free as possible. So how do we actually do this? Well, as said earlier, we're going to look at the actual science behind what looks good, um, how, how we as uh, humans, how our brains interpret different things um, and how we can utilize that um, in our applications to create this good, engaging, intuitive um, atmosphere that will draw people in and make them actually keep using the application. So the first concept that we're going to be looking at um, is called the rule of thirds. And this is pretty much uh, what it says on the tin. Um, you split your uh, frame into thirds in both dimensions, vertically and horizontally. And this gives you a grid with which you can start to frame your composition. So the rule of thirds is largely used in things like uh, photography and, and art um, for when people are composing images and trying to think of the best way to frame a subject so that it will actually engage the, the eye of the, of the viewer. And the interesting thing here is that the reason that it's split into into thirds is that this is something that our brain naturally, it's a pattern that our brain naturally looks for. And it's because of the way that the human face is, is structured. Um, the eyes appear almost a third of the way down, and then we have a third again for the mouth. And those lines that go across the face, that's where we look um, to see someone's expression and their emotion. So we learn to look for these third lines across here and also the third lines down here, which line up with the center of the eyes and, and the uh, corners of the mouth. And those are the areas that we learn to look, look to, to gain our information on how someone's feeling. And in a very similar way, that, that, that means that then we can use the fact that that's the pattern that we look for by actually framing things so that they appear aligned with those particular lines that we're used to looking for. So as you can see here in this image um, of the Eiffel Tower, rather than the Eiffel Tower being in the center um, of the shot, it's actually been pushed off to the side. It lines up with that third line. And then we can see we also have the tree line that goes across um, along the bottom horizon uh, third line. And this creates um, a sense of space within the image and more of a sense of, of flow. We have these interesting points um, that we're, that are the focus of, of the image, which is the, the actual Eiffel Tower itself, is aligned to those intersections that we're already, our brain is already looking for. 
and then by having it off center you can create this kind of flow this image uh, this idea of depth where you have the line of the tree line scooping up to uh the uh to to the eiffel tower's peak and that roughly follows the horizontal line across a third line across and the vertical third line up so we can kind of see this um in like side by side comparison here we've got these two images of the same rock um, on the left hand side it's very much flat in the center um, and at first that image looks like maybe it has um, maybe it's a little bit flat you know you you look at it and your attention is either in me solely focused on on the rock and you can't really make your eyes move elsewhere um, or it naturally diverts your attention away and off to the side so you end up having this kind of slope where your eyes are really only looking at half the image rather than the whole image so that composition ends up having little impact uh, because of because of this whereas on the right hand side uh, the rock feature in, in this image is aligned with the third line and we also have the horizon um, aligned with the with the uh, horizontal third line and this creates a lot more space in the image it's not here is a rock that's in your face it's guiding the viewer into the image which gives you a hell of a lot more engagement um, it kind of simulates a, a dialogue between yourself and and the image it's an interaction and so we also can can utilize things like this to uh, showcase again this kind of flow uh, where you've got the the lines of the clouds that sweep around to the line of the horizon and then that comes up again sweeping from the uh, lower third line to the left third line uh, in line with the rock feature so it has a lot more um, of an impact it draws the viewer in a lot more and it's more comfortable to look at than the picture on the left. So what does this actually mean for our applications? How, how can we how can we utilize this uh, this knowledge um, to make our UI more appealing? Well we can start off by um, doing things like aligning important information along those third lines. Uh, we can also use it to actually section off areas of our application. If we come back to having a look at the uh, at the rock feature image here, you'll see that each section um, on the right hand side kind of has um, its own nice composition um, involved in it, within it, and we can actually simulate that within our own applications by kind of taking the fact that we've got these nine segments and making each segment have its own kind of importance so when we look at an example of this um, in well i would say in the real world but this isn't actually a real world example this is just one that i knocked up yesterday um, this is a uh, landing page for an application for a, a bespoke ice cream parlor um, called cookies and cream they sell ice cream and cookies it's the kind of place where i would love to be um, this this uh, menu screen here um, is designed to kind of draw the viewer in towards um, that the menu so that they can then that's where your eyes want to go you click that button you go see the amazing products we have on offer you go and order them and everyone's happy and if we zoom away a little bit from that and actually apply our rule of thirds we can see that this actually lines up with uh, the with the third lines rather well so what we've done is we've divide, uh, divided the screen into these visibly um, visually sensible sections so you've got one third dedicated to the to the ice cream one third dedicated to the cookies and obviously the central third is dedicated to that actual menu and 
this helps to kind of tell the the narrative of the uh, of the the company and the product um, that that they're selling, while also utilizing the fact that by moving those images in towards those um, third lines, so that where the images stop and the like menu section starts is exactly in line with those third lines, we are guiding the viewer's eye in towards that central menu. If you look at the either either image, your eye ends up naturally going towards the centre, which is of course the focus as where we want them to um, to click so that they can go away and um, actually order some cookies and ice cream, have a lovely time and give us lots of money. So we utilise um, the, the fact that we can create these segments in order to really focus the attention, guide the eye through the application. So next concept uh, we're going to have a look at is the golden ratio. And you may have heard of this as uh, either the golden ratio or the Fibonacci spiral. Uh, this is a, uh, a pattern that was that was spotted by uh, mathematicians who were looking at um, natural phenomenon, and they were finding that this this pattern, uh, this ratio, seemed to appear throughout nature. And this ratio has subsequently been used for all sorts of things. Um, you can see here uh, it's commonly uh, referenced as the main compositional factor of the Mona Lisa and why the Mona Lisa is um, one of the most like kind of visually drawing and appealing paintings. And it's also our good old friend the Eiffel Tower from our previous example also utilises the golden ratio where the spire section of the, uh, of the Eiffel Tower is proportional to to the legs by 1 to uh, 1.618 which is the the ratio uh, that that controls this this spiral and if we see um, as we can see in, in this image here are just a few examples of where people have kind of spotted this this pattern and it's interesting because the, the human brain looks for patterns that's how we understand things that's how we gain um, knowledge how we learn things and it if you if you show uh, the the human brain a pattern that it can recognize then it's almost like a calming thing it, it it's a it's something that we that we look for and then when we find it we're like oh phew, relief we've we've found a pattern we can now understand this um, and interpret this information and by using a pattern that occurs so frequently in nature, what you can actually do is almost trick the mind into thinking that it's looking at something that feels natural, uh, has natural proportions, even though it's actually obviously an application is <laughs> very technical and not natural. So what, what would this look like in an application? How would we use this uh, in, in an application? Well, one of the easiest ways to think about it uh, is if we have a look back at the uh, at this image here where we've broken it down um, into the spiral and all of the uh, different shapes, uh, the different sized rectangles that that spiral um, defines, you can immediately start to have a think about, well, if this is my screen and I've got my landscape um, tablet app layout, and I want to have a menu bar on the side. If I choose to make it the width of uh, that second largest square or the width of that third largest square, then it will have a natural proportion compared to the space that is left over. And by applying this um, through you know, multiple times and in, in using all the different shapes and sizes that are available to you in that spiral, you can actually start to build up uh, an application that ends up looking like it's naturally proportioned. Even something that is uh, definitely not 
a natural uh, looking application um, like obviously this one is focused around Star Wars and uh, the Clone Wars and the idea behind this application would be um, that you can scroll through lots of the different characters who appear in the show um, and you can click on them and gain um, some information like their, their actual bios um, on the left hand side but all of this all of the features within this application, including the, the data cards, as well as the actual overall layout, have been specifically designed to utilize the golden ratio, which gives it an idea when, you, when you're looking at it, it guides your eye through to the important information because your eye kind of naturally follows that spiral, spiral round. And also just having those natural proportions between sections can be really, really useful, um, especially when you're creating buttons. Um, you, you want to be able to have a button that is a pleasing um, aspect ratio. And using the golden ratio can really, really help towards just making sure that you've um, got that really nice aesthetic um, on each of your elements, not just the overall layout. And it can help you to lead um, the viewer's eye towards that information um, in that natural manner and just make it so that they're comfortable looking at it um, compared to if you were, for example, to make those data cards very narrow, it would no longer um, seem as comfortable to look at as it does now. So the next concept we'll be talking about is negative space. And negative space is a hugely underrated tool. Negative space is defined as the blank space around um, an, an object or the subject of your uh, either photograph composition, or in our case, we're going to be thinking about um, elements in our applications. And you can see in, in this photograph here, um, the majority of the photograph is white space just blank and that isn't a mistake that's a decision it's a conscious choice and when we look at the image we can kind of see why because it creates this idea of space um, it's kind of it sounds trite to say but space creates a sense of spaciousness and we have here the obviously the, the hand holding the paper aeroplane and it creates this idea of that small plane in this big space and the idea that it has the freedom to then move around um, all of that space. So you can use it to convey a message, uh, but you can also use it to basically be like a bit of a slow down and a calm down on your application. As we saw with the, the last application, um, it was quite busy, there was lots going on. Sometimes you want an application that will just be able to give the viewer space. Really useful um, use case that I, that I was working on for a customer in a previous role uh, was for a well-being application. And in these sorts of instances, you don't want clutter um, and, or disorganized things filling up the screen you want people to be able to um, look at the the application and feel calm and feel like it gives them space so super important thing you should view negative space as an asset that you place on the screen not as you know just something that happens because you put in a button it has to be the blank space you, you put on the application is just as important as your content and to make a good UI you need to be constantly thinking about that negative space. So let's have a quick look at um, an example of why, why negative space is important. Um, so on the left hand side um, you see a uh, little gallery of some, some of the endangered animals uh, that we have at the moment in the world um, and in this particular 
example, on the left-hand side, there's very little negative space. Everything is kind of all squished together. Um, there's no gap between the image and the text, um, no gap between the image on one row and the image on the next row. Everything is really compact. And on the right-hand side, on, in contrast to that, we have a lot of negative space. Um, everything is spaced out and allowed um, allowed its own room uh, to to breathe. And the interesting thing about this is that the the human brain um, it, it really struggles to separate things that are really close. Um, you need to have space between things for your brain to recognise that they are separate things. And it allows the viewer to to have that better sense of comprehension um, and it avoids that kind of overwhelmed feeling that you can sometimes have when you look at something that is really compact. So if, you, if you've ever been sent a, a wall of text that has no paragraph breaks in it whatsoever, you can you know how daunting that is to, to look at and, and read compared to something that could potentially be longer than the original piece of text, but so long as it's broken up into paragraphs, our mind finds it easier to digest and go through that information. So how else could we could we use it in, in an application? Um, I would go so far as to say as this this use case that you see here doesn't really count as an example um, as such because this is what you should be doing in every single application. Um, always we should be using things like the padding um, properties in order to uh, pad down our, our icons, things like that, um, create a margin between images um, and text, make sure that there's decent line spacing between um, different elements of text. But if we wanted to go even further and utilize that narrative aspect, that messaging aspect of neg negative space, then this is an example of how we could do that. So this application is um, essentially this example is meant to be a home screen for an application for a charity that does con conserva conservation work with uh, giant pandas out in the wild. Um, and obviously the messaging here is that our panda population is fading away. Um, and the the imagery combined with the the negative space on on the left hand side of the screen um, hopefully really conveys that that message. And the the other thing that it does in having so much of the screen dedicated to negative space is it creates this hyper focus on two elements that, that your eye is drawn to. One is the eye of the panda, um, which of course helps with the narrative message. And the other is the donate button, which is of course where we want our users focus to end up. You'll notice how here we've used um, very small text. Um, obviously, that's not because we, we've run out of space on the screen, um, but we're utilising the fact that all that real estate on the screen is actually being used as negative space. And we have that small line of text, which again, it draws people towards that donate button, draws people in, allows the rest of the space to convey that message and uh, really guide the user to where we want them to be looking. Similarly, of course, we don't overwhelm that donate circle with the text. It, the text doesn't go right to the edges of the circle uh, because that then creates a bit of an unprofessional look. And the reason it looks unprofessional is because it hasn't been allowed room to breathe around it. There's no negative space. So in this instance, um, by making sure that we've got a suitable amount of space around um, the the text, which we can also um, utilize things like the golden ratio to determine exactly how much space is natural um, to, to have around these sorts of things, then uh, we actually can aid the, the decision making of, of our users. 
And we can also see how this would look like in potentially in a mobile um, design rather than the tablet form factor. But the the major thing to take away from this is that it's not just important to think about what you put on the screen, it's important to think about where you put it. And not just in terms of, um, oh, I'll put that on the top left, um, because that's where I would expect a, a back button when I'm uh, using using an iPhone. We, we need to be thinking about um, where it goes in where things are placed in relation to the other items on the screen um, to make sure that there's enough spacing between them and really when you do that you you just improve the balance of your entire layout um, and it creates a it, it can be used to create a very minimalist but very clean ui and the i think the the main goal that you should aim for um especially if, if if UI is not one of your your strong points, the first goal that you should aim for is cleanliness in your UI. You want to have something that looks pristine, um, it looks thought out. Minimalism can really, really help towards that and negative space is a huge part of that. So our final topic um, for, for the day will be um, complementary colours and just colour theory in, in general. So if we have a quick look at this colour wheel, you'll see colours naturally kind of convey a mood or um, convey a, a heat. So we have the reds through to the yellows. These are what we call warm colours. Um, it, it makes sense when we think about what colour of fire is that we consider red, orange and yellow to be to be warm colours. And on the flip side, um, the left hand side of, of the colour wheel, as you see here, um, the blues and the purples, they are cold colours. And so when colours naturally fall into these, these categories, we can utilise the properties um, of those different categories uh, to our advantage. So warm colours are generally um, considered more exciting, um, they're, they're bright, we can have meaning associated with them as well. We generally associate things with yellow, like yellow with happiness and the sun. We generally associate red with um, passion or danger is obviously uh, a frequent meaning behind uh, behind these, these colours. Whereas the cooler colours are generally, um, they have more calming moods. So we can think of um, normally blue is a, can be associated with things like sadness or the sea, the sky, these really big open spaces. And if we're utilising colours um, to, to convey moods, what can be really, really useful is actually contrasting those colours. And colours opposite each other on the colour wheel are actually naturally complementary. And one of the reasons behind that is because one is warm and one is cold. And yet because they're on the opposite sides, they end up going very nicely together. Um, obviously we can see here red and green, that classic Christmas combination um, works really lovely together. Purple and yellow generally used um, to convey things like monarchy, um, you would have purple and gold um, robes all over all of the kings and queens of old. Um, blue and, and orange is a colour scheme that we, we will see come up um, in, in media uh, throughout the, the coming slides. So not only um, can you utilise these to take advantage of the warm colours and the cold colours and enable certain areas of your application to be, for example, more accented or more engaging um, than potentially a calmer background. Also, using complementary colours means that you avoid clashes, which is always really handy. <laughs> so mentioned about complementary colours in media, 
Um, and if you look at um, movie posters, you will often find that they use this formula really, really well. If we have a look in the top, uh, at the top image here from Thor Ragnarok, um, we can see that poster is largely red and green. It utilizes the, the green of the Hulk and also some green elements that they, uh, that they have brushed over the top of the image with the red background and it contrasts um, each other and really helps, each color helps the other stand out and just makes it really eye grabbing. Similarly, the Guardians uses the blue and orange and Avengers Endgame um, is very much focused around these purples and golds. And this, this is actually almost an epidemic in uh, movie posters. You end up with collections of images like this where we can see all of the posters here are utilizing blue and orange as, as the, the two complementary colors. And if you if you end up having a another look through through IMDb, you'll end up with a, a ton of posters that fit into this uh, this pattern. And the reason that they do it is because those contrasting colors create that eye catching um, mesh uh, for for the viewer's eyes, because you see these colors that appear opposite each other working together creates that contrast, you've got the warm and the cold, and everything comes together to just be engaging. But you don't have to just go with um, opposites. There are also other uh, colour schemes that you can that you can use that will enable you to have more than obviously two colours uh, in your colour scheme. So the analogous colour scheme uh, that we see on, on the left here, um, that utilises colours that are next door neighbours. Um, these are colours that are similar in mood, creates a more subtle difference um, between uh, elements. This is good for applications where you don't really want anything in particular to stand out, or you have, uh, for example, a, a company that is very much, their brand is focused around one particular colour. And it just allows you to uh, basically have variation, slight variations on that colour throughout the application um, that will keep it in that very subtle uh, monochrome feel. Triadics are really useful because you reduce while, while they all work together and they all contrast each other to a certain extent, you reduce the intensity of that contrast because rather than contrasting purple with yellow, you're contrasting a slightly more red purple with a with an orange. So they're slightly closer together. There's still an element of contrast there, but it's a little bit closer together. Split complementary, again, you're taking, rather than taking the opposite, you just go a little bit further out. Very useful if you want to have like one primary colour that stands out very strongly against two um, secondary colours. And finally, um, in the square, in this particular uh, colour colour scheme, you end up with four colours that kind of have equal weighting, equal power. And, and a good example of being able to utilise this colour scheme well is uh, the Microsoft logo. So building colour schemes, like using these rules to be able to actually build these colour schemes can set you off on a really, really good starting point. But it's not just the actual like, colour, the actual hue that you need to consider. It's also really important to consider saturation and values. I think we've all been there where we've seen um, an application from like the 70s or 80s where they decided it was a brilliant idea to have a f bright yellow background with bright blue text on top of it. And you might think just by looking at the colour wheel, well that should work because blue and yellow were, well they're almost complementary, they're split complementary. But the problem there is that when you've got such high saturation on your colours, you you lose all sense of subtlety. Everything is suddenly 
brash and in in your user's face and it's uncomfortable to look at something that is so heavily saturated for any period of time so it's always best um, for applications to at least make sure that your um, the main color that people will be viewing for the for the majority of their time in your application is either a lower saturation or a very pale color um, like white for example um, often really good to choose pastel colors uh, this gives everything a more kind of calm subtle inviting view um, rather than having those really harsh colors though it's useful to use um, highly saturated colors for things like warnings that you want to flag up anything that really requires the user's attention right now um, can be can be useful uh, for saturation high saturation and of course we also need to consider um, values so whether something is is very is dark so it has a low value as opposed to being um, light so it has a high value um, having lots and lots of low value colors can be quite moody and you probably want to have a nice contrast and mixture between them not just for the the fact that you want to have that balance of moods but also obviously for accessibility reasons you want to make sure that you're going to have uh, elements that are clearly visible and distinct from each other and by having low values and high values you can actually um, get that into your application one big tip that i would say um, when it comes to saturation is never use pure black um, it always ends up looking uncomfortable um, in an application if you just offset that black just a touch um, even just taking it to say 20 or so in each of the red green and blue channels then you end up with this dark gray which is actually a, lo a lot easier on the eyes so that's a quick pro tip there for you so what do we get if we put all of this together and try and create an application using all of these techniques that we've learned well, here is a course registration uh, mobile app um, that I created for, for a demo a while ago. And I was intrigued to see how does this actually fit with, um, with these rules. And we can start to see through so the rule of thirds, if we draw our third lines on, we can see that actually it works quite well with the, <coughs> with the, with the rule of thirds. We have our central home button which is only just a little bit over that central third section. Of course, we don't want to restrict ourselves to being absolutely on the line all the time because then it can create a kind of formulaic um, view. <coughs> what we do want is to be able to uh, be roughly in that area. So our our eyes looking for those those lines will be able to find what they're looking for similarly uh, we've got a little bit of padding on the side but our central image of um, of the girl at her graduation is also um, aligned nicely with with those third lines and we see that the the main focus of that that image uh, being being the the girl's face is again focused along uh, those that third line and we've utilized the the segments uh, to uh, that are created by drawing in those 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 lines to have different features and different focuses so the bottom left segment is wholly dedicated to that my courses button the bottom right is wholly dedicated to my shortlist we've got that central button which is the central two buttons which is obviously where we're guiding our user towards and they take up one segment and all of this comes together to create a balanced layout um, that guides the user's eye to where we want it to be again speaking of balanced layouts and guiding our user's eye um, when we look at the golden ratio we see 
that we actually have uh, when we include the the negative space um, around our, uh, our buttons that appear underneath the image we actually have here that ratio that we are expecting to be able to to see um, and to and to view and this creates that kind of natural um, inviting look into that image and the buttons that have been included below and this is also why those buttons make sense to be closer to the image rather than uh, down maybe directly in between in the space in between the image and the home button again negative space this is used everywhere in the, in this particular screen um, the idea of it is supposed to be fresh um, inviting spaciousness and and that negative space allows us to create that atmosphere and also complementary colors um, the image that we chose for the background focuses mainly on orange and blue uh, which we can see from the uh, the color wheel are opposite each other so this is how you can start to see where by using all of these techniques we've managed to create an application that looks inviting looks engaging um, it has a clean feel to it it has a spacious and fresh feel to it and it just makes it inviting and engaging for a user to use and it also makes it easy to use you look at that application you know exactly where you need to go to get your information and that's the experience that we all want to get across to all of our users So thank you very much um, for attending attending the session. Um, I hope you found that really useful um, and I hope that you'll have fun playing around with some of those UI elements and techniques in your own Canvas apps in future. Um, this recording um, of this session will be available, um, I think 14 days after the event. Um, and that will be the same for all of the um, all of the sessions. So if there's one that, that unfortunately you had to miss because you're going to another one, or if there's just one that you want to catch up on again, then that will all be available um, on the Scottish Summit YouTube channel. For now, um, just thank you so much for, for coming along. Um, make sure to share on socials um, your virtual Scottish Summit uh, day and, and how that experience is, is going for you. Um, and please make sure to just enjoy as many sessions as possible and have a lovely day. Cheers.